I am General of the Army Ulysses S. Grant, and you join me in the war room as I reflect upon the career during the war and after of Major General John Alexander Logan, in my opinion, the most successful political appointee general in the war. I should like to reflect a bit about his uh, phenomenal record. He began the war as a colonel of volunteers of the 31st Illinois, and that appointment was effective September the 18th of 1861. He was then appointed Brigadier General of Volunteers, effective March the 21st of 1862. On November the 29th of 1862, he was confirmed as Major General of Volunteers. He rose upon the death of Major General John B. McPherson, July 22nd, in Atlanta during the Battle of Atlanta being the ranking officer in the area, he assumed command of the Army of the Tennessee. He held that rank from uh, July 22nd through July 27th, where he was relieved uh, upon recommendation of General Sherman, forwarded by General Halleck to the president, and President Lincoln promptly confirmed Sherman's appointment of General O. O. Howard, Oliver Otis Howard. And uh, I should like to point out that he was the only political general to command an entire army in the field when he was the commanding officer of the Army of the Tennessee, the only political general to command an army in the field. He was, though, reappointed or reassigned to command of the Army of the Tennessee on May the 23rd of 1865, but more about that in a moment. His combat record is of note. He first participated in the war fighting at the Battle of First Bull Run. He had gone out with other congressmen. The battle did not go as was anticipated, and while others were fleeing back to Washington City, Major, or now Major General Logan, Congressman Logan grabbed the musket that had been thrown on the ground and joined in with the Michigan and some New York uh, soldiers from the New York Regiment and uh, ably fought uh, the Confederates in the Battle of Bull Run. He then stayed and helped move dead and wounded for several days into Washington City. He sought and got the appointment as Colonel of the 31st Illinois, and as such, he participated under my command in the Battle of Belmont in November of 61 and distinguished himself so much so that I personally uh, noted him uh, in my after action report, as did uh, his commanding officer, uh, General John A. McClernand. Then later, uh, he fought with me at Fort Donaldson. At Fort Donaldson, he was wounded three times, one shot through the shoulder, uh, and he refused to uh, leave the field to seek treatment. And when uh, the day had been saved, he felt uh, he went back to uh, a first aid station and got treatment for it, returned to the field, and led his troops again because it, uh, it was not going well again for us. And he was wounded in the thigh, shot in the thigh, and actually received a grazing wound someplace else. So he was wounded three times. But he stayed on the field until night fell and the battle ended and the day was saved. He had lost so much blood, though, that he spent almost a month recuperating. Uh, and his wife, in fact, came down from Illinois and uh, nursed him back to health. But because of that wound, he missed the Battle of Shiloh. He was involved, though, in the Second Battle of Corinth, and he was actively involved in the Vicksburg Campaign in command of a division. He fought nobly at Champion Hill and the Battle of Raymond, Mississippi. He did very well, distinguished himself, he and his uh, division, in that campaign. He then fought in the Battle of Atlanta. He was moving with Sherman and... Uh, 
on July 22nd of 64, Major General John B. McPherson rode too far. He thought he was within our lines, but he rode too far and uh, rode into some Confederate soldiers. He doffed his hat, turned his, his horse, put the spurs to him to get away, but one of the soldiers was able to get a shot and killed General McPherson. General Sherman appointed General Ale uh, Logan to succeed McPherson in command of the Army of the Tennessee, which, as I noted earlier, is the only time in the war that a political appointee, a civilian general, assumed command of an army in the field. Quite a distinction. Uh, but in six days, Sherman uh, relieved him of command, and uh, General O.O. Howard assumed command of the Army of the, of the uh, Tennessee. And, and we'll address that, what Sherman had to say about why he did that. But he was again given command of the Army of the Tennessee on May 23rd at the end of the war. And on May 24th of 1865, he rode at the head of the Army of the Tennessee in the Grand Review in Washington, D.C. He led the parade as a recognition of his distinguished service in the war. And uh, to some extent, Sherman was wanting to ease his angst over having been relieved as the commanding officer for the Army of the Tennessee. But he uh, fought well throughout uh, Corinth and Vicksburg and then Atlanta, the Atlanta campaign, after he was relieved of command, the president called for him to come back to Illinois and campaign for the president. And he did so. Uh, he was uh, ready to go back because he had been relieved of command. He, he'd been at that pinnacle of responsibility and honor for six days, and then it was taken away from him, and he was greatly chagrined. But the president wanted him to come back and campaign, and he did. So he did so well in the campaign that the president carried Illinois handily, and uh, he offered General Logan a brigadier general rank in the regular army. But Logan turned that down. He wanted to be with his troops in the field. He requested to be reassigned command of the 15th Division, his old division, under Sherman's command, and that was granted him. And he went on the, through uh, the march to uh, the sea through Georgia. And then he participated in the Carolinas campaign and had quite the uh, climactic end to that that I will lift up for you. But regarding Sherman relieving him of command, that was controversial and I, I feel remains controversial. I should like to read to you what Sherman had to say about why he recommended the volunteer general, political general, to be replaced with the professional soldier general, O.O. Uh, o. Howard, and with a couple of observations involved. Sherman said, it first became necessary to settle the important question of who should succeed General McPherson. General Logan had taken command of the Army of the Tennessee by virtue of his seniority and had done well, but I did not consider him equal to the command of three corps. Between him and General Blair, there existed a natural rivalry. Both men were of great courage and talent, but were politicians by nature and experience, and it may be that for this reason they were mistrusted by regular officers like General Schofield, Thomas, and myself. It was all important that there should exist a perfect understanding among the Army commanders, and at a conference with General George H. Thomas at the headquarters of General Thomas J. Woods, commanding a division of the Fourth Corps, he, Thomas, General George Thomas, remonstrated warmly against my recommending that General Logan should be regularly assigned to the command of the Army of the Tennessee by reason of his accidental seniority. Thomas, I, I should like to observe here, George Thomas threatened to resign 
if Sherman named Logan to command the Army of the Tennessee because he so disliked Logan. Sherman later said, if there was a man on earth whom Thomas hated, it was Logan. But he goes on to say, Sherman does, we discussed fully the merits and qualities of every officer of high rank in the Army and finally settled on Major General O. O. Howard as the best officer who was present and available for the purpose. And on the 24th of July, I telegraphed to General Halleck this preference, and it was promptly ratified by the President. General Howard's place in command of the Fourth Corps was filled by General Stanley, one of his division commanders, on the recommendation of General Thomas. All of these promotions happened to fall upon West Pointers, and doubtless Logan and Blair had reason to believe that we intended to monopolize the higher honors of the war for the regular officers. I remember well my own thoughts and feelings at the time, and feel sure that I was not intentionally partial to any class. I wanted to succeed in taking Atlanta, and needed commanders who were purely and technically soldiers, men who would obey orders and execute them promptly and on time. For I knew that we would have to execute some most delicate maneuvers requiring the utmost skill, nicety, and precision. I believe that General Howard would do all these faithfully and well, and I think the result has justified my choice. I regarded both Generals Logan and Blair as volunteers that looked to personal fame and glory as auxiliary and secondary to their political ambition and not as professional soldiers. An addenda regarding fighting Joe Hooker. As soon as it was known that General Howard had been chosen to command the Army of the Tennessee, General Hooker applied to General Thomas to be relieved of the command of the 20th Corps, and General Thomas forwarded his application to me, approved and heartily recommended. When Howard reminded Sherman, General O. o. Howard, reminded Sherman that Hooker and another Corps commander and former commander of the Army of the Potomac had seniority, Sherman angrily said, Hooker has not the moral qualities that I want, nor those adequate to the command. Uh, more insight into what Sherman was thinking and why he was doing what he was doing. General Hooker, Sherman goes on to say, was offended because he was not chosen to su succeed McPherson, but his chances were not even considered. Indeed, I had never been satisfied with him since his affair at the Culp House and had been more than once disposed to relieve him of his corps because of his repeated attempts to interfere with Generals McPherson and Schofield. So, so much for General Hooker being the replacement for General McPherson and insight into what Sherman indeed insight to Sherman by what he said about why he replaced uh, Logan as the commanding officer of the Army of the Tennessee. So he went back to campaign for the president, returned to the command of his 15th, beloved 15th Corps, went through the March to the Sea, the Carolinas campaign, and got to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, with Sherman's army and was there while Sherman was negotiating with Joe Johnston, Joseph Eggleston Johnston, about the surrender of his army, uh, some 90, some 30,000 men. Sherman had 90,000 men. Uh, Johnston had fallen back into Raleigh, North Carolina. They erected dirt walls all around the city. But Sherman's men, his 30,000, were unquestionably no match for Sherman, some 90,000 plus. So Johnston decided to negotiate a surrender and was working with Sherman. 
But then on the 17th of April, Sherman received a telegram saying that the president was dead, had been killed by an assassin. He was greatly concerned about this. He had gone, he, he told the telegraph operator, say nothing about this to anyone. And he said nothing until he went with Joe Johnston. He showed Johnston in private the telegram saying that Lincoln was dead. And General Johnston was shocked and greatly saddened, dismayed, because he knew the South had lost a friend. But on the 17th, as Sherman is meeting with Johnston in those delicate times of the president being dead and the news reaching the army, Sherman issued his special order number 56, headquarters, military division of the Mississippi, in the field, Raleigh, North Carolina, April 17th, 1865. The general commanding announces with pain and sorrow that on the evening of the 14th instant at the theater in Washington City, His Excellency, the President of the United States, Mr. Lincoln, was assassinated by one who uttered the state motto of Virginia, at the same time, the Secretary of State, Mr. Seward, while suffering from a broken arm, was also stabbed by another murderer in his own house, but still survives, and his son was wounded supposedly fatally. It is believed by persons capable of judging that other high officers were destined to share the same fate. Thus it seems that our enemy, despairing of meeting us in open, manly warfare, begins to resort to the assassin's tools. Your general does not wish you to infer that this is universal, for he knows that the great mass of the Confederate Army was scorned to sanction such acts, but he believes that the legitimate consequence of rebellion against rightful authority. We have met every phase which this war has assumed and must now be prepared for it in its last and worst shape, that of assassins and guerrillas. But woe unto the people who seek to expend their wild passions in such a manner, for there is but one dread result. When the soldiers in the army found out about this, they determined in a lynch mob mentality that they were going to storm and destroy Raleigh, North Carolina. The mayor and, and board of aldermen had uh, surrendered the city, begging that it not be destroyed. Sherman was respecting that. They knew what had happened to Columbia and Atlanta and did not want it to happen to Raleigh. Sherman was respecting that, but on the, the night of the 17th, about 2,000 men from either the 15th Logans or the 20th Corps, formerly Hooker's, uh, decided they were going to advance on Raleigh and burn it to the ground. And <clears throat> one Union soldier who was there, Theodore Upson, wrote this in his observations about what happened. A mob of some 2,000 or more started for the city, saying they would destroy it. General Logan got in their front and ordered them back to their camps. They still went on. Then Logan, with three or four pieces of cannon behind him, threatened to open fire. And he told them he had double-shotted them with canister. They gave up and went back to their camp. General Logan saved the city, and it owes him a debt it can never pay. I understand they're even talking about erecting a statue to him in a southern city. The war was over. Logan, as I said, was offered a brigadier general's rank in the regular army. He declined it, wanted to go back to his civilian life and hopefully go back to Congress, which he promptly did. He was elected to Congress, and... Uh, now, in 1868, he is the second commander of the Grand Army of the Republic. And Decoration Day has long been a day in the South to remember 
the, the folks that have gone before, and the uh, people, ladies of the South and the North, have been actu actually having a decoration day for the soldiers who have fallen in battle in defense of their country. And the talk had been of something to be called a Memorial Day. General Logan, now the second commanding officer of the GAR, issued the uh, General Orders Number 11. Headquarters, Grand Army of the Republic, Washington, D.C., May 5th of 1868. And General Orders Number 11 says, the 30th day of May, 1868, is designated for the purpose of strewing with flowers or otherwise decorating the grave of comrades who died in defense of their country during the late rebellion and whose bodies now lie in almost every city, village, hamlet, and churchyard in the land. In this observance, no form or ceremony is prescribed, but posts and comrades will, in their own way, arrange such fitting services and testimonials of respect as circumstances may permit. We are organized comrades, as our regulations tell us, for the purpose, among other things, of preserving and strengthening those kind and fraternal feelings which have bound together the soldiers, sailors, and marines who united to suppress the late rebellion. What can aid more to assure this result than by cherishing tenderly the memory of our heroic dead, who made their breasts a barricade between our country and its foes? Their soldier lives were the reveille of freedom to a race in chains, and their deaths the tattoo of rebellious tyranny in arms. We should guard their graves with sacred vigilance. All that the consecrated wealth and taste of the nation can add to their adornment and security is but a fitting tribute to the memory of her slain defenders. Let no wanton foot tread rudely on such hallowed grounds. Let pleasant paths invite the coming and going of reverent visitors and fond mourners. Let no vandalism of avarice or neglect, no ravages of time, testify to the present or to the coming generations that we have forgotten as a people the cost of a free an undivided republic. If other eyes grow dull and other hands slack, and other hearts cold in the solemn trust, ours shall keep it well as long as the light and warmth of life remains to us. Let us then, at the time appointed, gather around their sacred remains and garland the passionless mounds above them with choicest flowers of springtime. Let us raise above them the dear old flag that they save from dishonor. Let us in this solemn presence renew our pledges to aid and assist those whom they have left among us as sacred charges upon the nation's gratitude, the soldiers and sailors, widow and orphan, it is the purpose of the Commander-in-Chief to inaugurate this observance with the hope it will be kept from year to year while a survivor of the war remains to honor the memory of his departed comrades. He earnestly desires the public press to call attention to this order and lend its friendly aid in bringing it to the notice of comrades in all parts of the country in time for simultaneous compliance therewith. Department commanders will use every effort to make this order effective. By order of John A. Logan, Commander-in-Chief, N.P. Chipman, Adjutant General. General Logan is credited with beginning Memorial Day observations, although it is fair to say and should be said 
that all over the South, the ladies of the South were decorating the graves of Confederate and Federal soldiers, for they were trying to heal. And they decorated and remembered all who had fallen in the fight, be they North or South. All over the North, this was taken up and uh, Decoration Day became a Memorial Day. And it was General Logan, it is General Logan's fond hope that this should become a national institution and it shall always be done so in memory of those who have fallen in defense of their country. And that was on May the 5th of 1868. But General Logan, Congressman Logan, did something else that uh, takes me aback, endears him to me even more so than already. He asked for and received the privilege in the convention of the National Union Republican Party in the, at the Crosby House in Chicago, Illinois on May 21st to put my name in nomination to be the candidate for the presidency of the United States, running and carrying the banner for the National Union Republican Party. And General Congressman Logan said this, he asked to be recognized, he was so recognized and said to the 650 delegates in the Crosby Opera House in the Republican Convention. Then, sir, in the name of the loyal citizens, soldiers, and sailors of this great Republic of the United States of America, in the name of loyalty, of liberty, of humanity, of justice, in the name of the National Union Republican Party, I nominate as candidate for the Chief Magistracy of this nation, Ulysses S. Grant. I'm told there was, uh, as it was described, thunderous applause. One ballot was taken and all 650 delegates unanimously approved me to be the candidate. And now I am running for the presidency of the United States and in part with the help of General Logan, who put my name in nomination. So a man I met on June the 19th of 1861, who was instrumental in my own regiment, the 21st Illinois, enlisting to a man, the 600 or so that were still in camp, and who fought with me at Belmont in my first battle, who fought with me at Donaldson and nearly lost his life in so doing. He had a sh horse shot out from under him at Belmont in his first battle, wounded three times at Fort Donaldson, came back and fought in the uh, battle, second battle of Corinth. He went on to fight with me and distinguished himself at Vicksburg, his regiment was given the honor of being the first to enter Vicksburg after the surrender and stacking of arms of the Confederates on the 4th of July, the first into Vicksburg. He then distinguished himself in, in the battles for Atlanta, was for a few days commander of the Army of the Tennessee, raised votes and campaign for President Lincoln, requested command in the field again, got it, fought from Atlanta to the sea, and then the Carolinas campaign, and is felt to be singly responsible for saving the city of Raleigh, North Carolina. And my good friend, and I think it is unquestionable that John Alexander Logan was the most successful political general in the War of the Late Rebellion, and I am proud and pleased to be able to state so. A final note, though, on General Logan I should like to lift up. He is one of the three people mentioned specifically in the official state song of the state of Illinois. In the last stanza, it says, and it's to the tune of Baby Mine, a very popular song now. Not without thy wondrous story, Illinois, Illinois, can be writ the nation's glory, Illinois, Illinois. On the record of thy years, Abraham Lincoln's name appears. Grant, 
and Logan and Our Tears, Illinois, Illinois, Grant and Logan and Our Tears, Illinois. General John A. Logan, the most successful political appointee civilian general in the war, a distinguished soldier, and now distinguished congressman. For the moment, I have said quite enough, and I must bring my reflections to a close. And I bid you a fond farewell.